everybody here has done the, the uh, SOLIDWORKS, right? Yes, no? How many people have not done SOLIDWORKS? How many people here do not know what computer-aided design is? Okay, so you know what it is, right? Okay. So you take your CAD file. Well, how does that CAD file actually get made? It, you know, most, most people now have been exposed to a few different kinds of manufacturing, but in, it, predominantly in industry, CNC machining is, is the number one manufacturing method. Everybody's heard about it. Everybody's heard of NC machining or CNC machining. NC machining refers to numerical control machining. CNC machining refers to computer numerical control. Okay, so this machine here is a CNC router. It's a CNC mill, basically, but it has a higher speed uh, spindle on it. So it's computer driven, has an X, Y, and Z axis. It's only a, only a three, uh, three axis machine. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take like five students at a time, we're gonna walk over to the other room and I'm gonna show you how it actually gets programmed. It'll take like five minutes to do that, to show you how we actually generate a tool path off that. And then we're gonna come over here and we're gonna cut some samples. So we only have one computer we do this on. And the reason for that is, is because the set of the software that runs that machine is $20,000. So it's not like I can have it in every lab. Works. All right, so we program in MasterCAM. All right, um, it's pretty, if you've seen SOLIDWORKS, it's pretty familiar, menu bars, a few other things. So we're gonna cut this, and this is a solid model taken right out of SOLIDWORKS. So basically, we, we import our part into, into the CAD software, okay? And what we're seeing right here is the zero point of the machine. Now when we get over the machine, you'll notice that is gonna be the top of the material in the upper left hand corner. So we define where we start machining from, okay? Um, this is what we're machining, okay? So that's just a, a little box. Uh, but you'll notice it has pocket, it has a pocket here, a pocket here, and an island, what's called a, an island. So the first thing we have to do is we have to actually tell it what kind of machine we have. So this software package works with mills, lays, wire EDMs, and routers. And uh, it'll do art stuff too, but we don't deal with that. Um, so we have to tell it, we have this type of machine. Well, it's already pre-set up for our, our mill. Um, then what we do is we have parameters. So our parameters include things like, what are we gonna cut this with? So I selected a quarter inch flat end mill. So it's quarter inch in diameter and it's flat on the end. Okay, um, you have to be really careful with tool selection. So in this area here, there's about um, 30 thousandths, 0.30, 300 thousandths. Okay, so I have to pick a tool that can actually cut through there. So now if I pick an eighth inch end mill, for example, it's gonna take forever to cut through there. So, but if I can pick a half inch end mill, it won't fit through there and I won't clear that path. So I picked a quarter inch end mill and I can do all the operations with the quarter inch end mill. So that's what I've selected here. I've designated it as the first tool. Most CNC machines can take up to 21 tools. So you can do a bunch of milling, tapping operations with one, in, in one program. So then from here, I look at uh, my actual tool. It has a graphic representation of the tool and I can program in how many flutes it has and that's how many actually cutting surfaces it has. Primarily two flutes are what you use for woods and aluminums and, and plastics. Four flutes are more your steels. Um, in some cases, some tooling will cost more than the actual stock going in the machine. We have end mills here that run into the three to $400 end mills, okay? So once we once we were satisfied that our tool is correct, we um, we generate we generate our tool path. And so you've seen it flicker, and see these blue lines here. See these blue lines? Those show exactly where the tool is moving to. Okay. So, but I want to make sure before I put this in my machine, it's running, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. So I have a verification, a verification block here. And it actually visually shows me what it's actually gonna be cutting in the machine. Um, it's smart enough to know that if, if it goes too fast or if it's not inside the geometry, it'll turn red. 
So red is bad. So if we see red, we need to stop and figure out what we did wrong. The yellow indicates it's okay? Yeah, the yellow is just showing us the final part. And you notice how it's all chunky and ugly looking? It's called a roughing toolpath. You always rough and then you come in and do a finished toolpath. Rough is fast material removal. You can go faster, you can use higher speeds. It tends to tear out the material more. And then on the final pass, you'll notice it'll come in and it'll only take like two or three thousandths. It does a nice, clean, smooth pass on the end. Okay, and then once we verify that this is exactly what we want, we're gonna do a process called post-processing. So I can literally take this file here and run it on any CNC machine. I just have to tell the computer which CNC machine I'm running it on. So think of it as a printer driver, the difference between like an Epson, a Hewlett Packard, and a Canon. It's the same document, it's just the printer drivers talk differently. And so the post-processor allows me to actually, um, to actually tell it what's gonna happen. So now I'm gonna post this out, it's called posting. And I just basically tell it I'm gonna write the file. It asks me where I'm gonna put it. And I'm gonna put this one on my desktop because I don't wanna screw up the one in the machine. Okay, so it writes it. That's it, boom. You'll notice it's all XYZ. So you have a G code and an M code. A G code is a general code which tells the machine what to do to change the tool, turn the coolant on, turn the spindle on. An M code is specifically a movement code. Okay, so um, if we look down here, this is the entire program, all in X, Y, and Z. Okay. So this is what the machine's seeing, and you'll notice we cut in negative space. All of our Z moves are negative, so we're cutting down into the piece. Okay, some machines that's flipped, where they want you to cut down, but down's in positive space. But your post-processor will handle that. It used to be in the olden days, when I first started, you had to actually program this in by hand. And so their programs were really small. They did certain things like repetitive bolt hole circles and stuff. Now we can do full three-dimensional, this was CNC machined off a surface file. And you could not program that by hand. Okay? All right, so any questions on how it, how it gets done? Quick cool question. I have a quick answer. You have a quarter inch tool and it looks like you're, you're, you've got a, a corner that you're cutting. Mm -hmm. How does the quarter inch tool get to that corner? It doesn't. Okay. There's no way to do that. Okay. You can't cut a 90 degree corner yeah. with a round tool. Yeah, yeah. There's no way to do it. You could EDM it with wire or a sink or graphite electrode. So if you need a 90 degree corner, there are ways to do that. Okay. You're better off engineering around that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and mo most, most shops will they'll do that automatically. If you send something in with a 90 degree corner, they'll say, hey, can you do, is an eighth inch radius good? Because that means they can use a quarter inch cutter. Yeah, yeah. So it's the, 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 the cornering, the corner, the fillet in the corner is usually not programmed in. Yeah. That's usually a function of the actual tool. Okay. Because it would be really difficult to program that fillet in every time. Yeah, yeah. So it's just easier to do a 90 degree corner and then just cut it out with a quarter inch or half inch end mill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right. So what we want to do is we want to jog the machine. So now we're going to be doing stuff inside the machine. Okay. All right, so um, using your weapon of choice, which would be Le Mouse, you've got X and Y. So go ahead and move it around in X and Y. You can hold it down, it'll move. Okay? All right? So, I already have the zero set, so click go to X zero, Y zero, and hit go. You guys can come over to the side here. I've already seen this. Go, 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 over there. You sure? Okay, all right. Okay, so we have a program preloaded, which we're gonna run, which is what you've seen on the screen in there. What we want to do is we wanna click preview and look at that. Doesn't that look a lot like what we did in the other room? Yes, it does. Just say exit on that, okay? And when you're ready, hit the start button. Oh, wait, wait, wait stop, stop. First thing we need to do is jog this using these keys to the center of that block. 
just jog the head over to the center of the block. Okay, forward down a little bit. That's great. All right, now what we have to do is we have to tell it the machine is stupid. It does not know that there's material here. It has no idea. So let's slide this back. So this machine has no idea where the top of that material is. We need to tell it. So this adapter here sets the height of the material. So in tool, click tool and tell it to touch off Z0 position. It's moving. Okay. We just told it that's where the top of the material is. So as far as I'm concerned, we're ready to go. Hit the start button. It's a uh, foam. Now, now it's telling us to load tool one. So remember when I was talking about giving it a tool number? Mm -hmm. it's, it's telling me, hey operator, make sure you put tool one in there. Because if I put tool three in there, I'm gonna get a totally separate result. So go ahead and hit resume. spirals into the stock because it just doesn't plunge, it, it actually moves in slowly. Yes, it's actually cutting. It's just a sample piece. Okay. Just junk piece. <laughs> we do all kinds of stuff. It's, these, are, these take too long to cut. That's okay. it, this is made to cut in 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. Kind of one at a time, take a look and see what it's doing in there. You can see how it's, it's doing the rough because it's not nice and smooth like a finished part would be. It's taking the bulk of material away first and then it's gonna come in and do a rough. One thing we're gonna do now that we pause it is we're gonna override the speed. Since it's cutting okay, I'm gonna move the speed up so it cuts faster. Um, the computer software tends to be real um, conservative as far as how fast it cuts. Um, so. Do you finish with the same tool? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could change tools, but for what this is gonna be in the end, it's pretty easy. Okay, all right, so what we do is we have a feed override. We're 31% complete. We have a feed override here. I'm gonna just slide this up to like 140. 
140%. Okay. I'm going to make sure. Yep, we're good. So go ahead and hit resume. It'll go a lot faster now. It's moving much faster now. Break your tool, yeah, but this stuff, this is this is foam. Yeah. So it, it'll go. You can go as fast as you want on here. That's about the maximum limited. At 150 is the max limit of the machine. Yeah. And then what happens? You get too much backlash from the machine, and it tears up the part. And they all come in different different hardnesses. The different materials we run. I can go in the software and change it and tell it, you know, to go in really tight spiral or coming in a big loose spiral. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking it'd be a problem if you had a part with, with the small dimensions. Right. And sometimes we'll, on that type of thing, we'll actually come in off the part. We won't actually go over the part. We'll come on the strap on the side and drive in that way. And if we have the right cutter, we can actually plunge straight in. Okay. So, but, but when you design to manufacture it, you got to take that into yeah. account. Last thing you've seen it do where it traced around all the edges, that's called a cleanup pass. Okay, so what I need you to do is bring the Z up, Z plus. Okay, that's good. And then jog X and Y and move the head off the part. Then we can all take a look at it. 
Okay. Um, so when you had it going really fast, there was some vibration that was happening. Mm -hmm. that was uh, how much does the error increase? It always increases because you got to look at you're hanging a tool and you're spinning it at 16,000 RPMs. Regardless of what material that's made of, you're going to get harmonics in the tip of the tool. And, and so your error will, okay, so if you need something really accurate, you need to machine it really slow mm -hmm. to keep the vibration down. But this is foam. It's pretty forgiving. I can drive through it at almost any speed. But the issue is, is, is you have to take that into account. Um, you actually want to try to use the shortest tool possible right. to cut. I use a long tool because it's easier to demonstrate with a long tool what it's at because you can actually see what's happening. But normally I would, I would keep the shoulder of the tool, which is this area right here, I'd keep it maybe an eighth of an inch above this. Okay? So I'm going to take this part out now using our fancy holding system. Okay. Before you work inside a machine, make sure the spindle's always turned off, okay? Because it doesn't know I'm there, and if I bump it or it accidentally gets turned on or there's a power surge and something happens, um, it doesn't know I'm there. It'll just tear you apart, so. Um, So I'm going to pass that around and you can actually see some tool drag marks because we were going pretty fast in the bottom. Um, who wants to cut one? Anybody want to play with the machine? You're in, you're up. Okay. So first thing we do, we, I have it pre-marked. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I have it pre-marked. I'll move over this way a little bit. So I know where everything's at. The only thing, the only thing you have to be really careful of, we have to reset that Z. Okay. Anytime you remove a stock and put a new piece of stock in, especially on something, this is called a spoil board. If it was a vise, it would be mm -hmm. different, but we have a spoil board, so we don't actually know, the machine doesn't actually know where the top of the stock is. We have to reset that Z every time. Um, I'll, we'll go through that in a second here. I mean, obviously I do it in the computer program, and the computer program knows where Z0 Z is, but the machine doesn't actually know where it's at. So what we're gonna do now is show where Z0 is. Okay. So this is a urethane foam. This is pretty common, you'll see a lot of this. They refer to it as butterboard uh, because it cuts so easy. Okay, so jog mm -hmm. over to where it's over the center of this. Now, we already know where zero is. That's not the problem. It's the Z zero we have to put in place. So drop Z down a little bit. Good, good. So this thing here automatically sets the tool length. So on tool, set Z zero, touch off. So that's called a tool probe. How does that communicate with the computer? Does it wait for, is it like a pressure sensor? It waits for the tip to touch it? No, this is electrically isolated from the spindle. Okay. And it drops a switch when it hits it. That's how it knows. So, just tell people it's magic. They'll think you're awesome. Okay? Okay. All right. So, we shut the spindle off. We do need to turn the spindle back on. Okay? Now, just hit start. Cool. It's going to ask you to change the tool. Okay? Just hit resume. We got the right tool. Notice it reset everything back to the original feed rate. That's all there is to it. They're real easy to run. Just don't be afraid of them. Okay? Follow some simple safety rules and you're good to go. So this is a this is a half inch end mill. It's a ball nose end mill. Um, you'll notice it's discolored at the top, and that's just because of heat buildup. And if you feel Right here on the edge, it doesn't feel very sharp anymore, but if you go back down to the flutes and feel the flutes, so this, this end mill is at the end of its life. Um, so this is an eighth inch ball end mill, and you notice the shank size is only about an inch. It's very small, so I couldn't do a long plunge on this. I, couldn't, I wouldn't cut any more than half the distance of the flutes on this. 
This is a carbide insert bit, router bit. Okay, this, I can plunge 50% of the tool length into the stock and I can move it 100 inches a minute. Um, it makes a lot of noise and throws a lot of chips, but these are the best tools for, for big material removal. One of the things to notice is that the tip of, the tip of this, it's not flat. It's actually, it actually has a negative rake angle and this is what's called a center cutting bit. So I can actually plunge much like a drill into the part and it'll clear the chips away from it. So with this end mill, notice how we spiraled coming in. I don't have to do that with this one. This one I can plunge straight in and just start cutting. Um, most CNC machines run collets. So when you load a tool into a collet, it's important to make sure it's seated up at the end at the very top part. So the base of the tool should be flush with the back end of the collet before you load it into the machine. If you don't, if it's down far, you'll notice you can see airspace in there. Can you get that? Yeah. Okay, there's airspace in there. If I do that, it'll allow this tool to actually vibrate. So when I come up, if I come up to maximum speed in this, which is 22,000 RPMs, this tool, the vibration up here is not gonna be that bad. But down here at the tip, we're gonna see a swing of a 16th of an inch, and it's just really gonna tear up your stock. You won't get a really good cut. So have it seated completely fully, it'll hold the tool really tight, and you'll get a good cut. I can get, I can get about 5,000. It's not as good as like a CNC machine. I've held a thousand on here though, but that's not the norm. That was, but we, we cut, Plastics, wood, it cuts acrylic really well. Very good for cutting acrylic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some of the parts we've done, is, that's just one part that we did. Hydroplane. So the harder materials are more accurate to cut than the softer material, okay? It's a difference between cutting plastic and aluminum. You're gonna get a much crisper, cleaner edge on aluminum than you are on a plastic. When you put this into the CAM software, do you need to specify what material you're doing or does it not care? It'll just <laughs> You can, I mean, you can go in and tell it exactly what material and what kind of tool you have, and it'll calculate everything for optimum machining, but inevitably, where you're gonna figure out your optimum at is you're gonna look at how it's cutting. And you're gonna say, oh, I can cheat the speed up a little bit, or oh, I have to slow it down. So you'll figure that out when you get into it. Um, but it's a good starting point, but, it's, but you're, you're, depending, you're depending on the vendor to be telling you that, oh yeah, I cut this material. Cause like all acrylic's not the same. You can have cast acrylic, which is a big sheet of cast acrylic, or you can have what's called, um, what's called forged acrylic, where they pour a sheet and then they machine it and stuff. And optical grade acrylic is cast differently than cast acrylic. So it, you won't know until you actually start cutting into it. So normally what we'll do, we'll take a small scrap sample and we'll put some slots in it and, and dial in our speed. Uh, with plastic, you have to be careful. If you go too fast, you'll melt it. So this machine doesn't use coolant, but what we can do is we can, we have an adapter, we can push cold air down into it and blow out the chips. So the question is, is what do you, what do, you do if you need the corners square? That's the corner, okay. So if you go to a smaller end mill, you're gonna give up time. Mm -hmm. But you could do another tool path after this to come in with a smaller end mill and clean up those corners. But the smaller end mills are very, very breakable. Let's put it that way. And in the, in the world of end mills, the smaller the end mill, the more expensive it is. Um, like I can, buy, I can buy a one millimeter end mill, okay? And it's $140. And as you can see how fast this machine can move, if you make one mistake, you break an end mill. Um, so with the quarter inch ones and stuff like this, so I try to design to where I don't have to buy specialty tools. 
Um, but if you do need square corners, there's other ways to do it, especially if you're dealing with metal. Mm -hmm. You would go to like EDM technology, electro discharge machining. Okay. Uh, it's just it's just it's more cost effective that way. But if you absolutely have to have to have it machined, you can get a machined. Uh, you you can never get a 90 degree square corner in CNC machining. Okay. But you can get close. Just depends how much money you want to spend. So much fun. Now it's gonna do it. It's gonna do a clean up pass next. Doing its last rough in the internal pocket. Anybody else want to do one? Okay. Right. Okay, cool. All right, let's take this one out of here. This precision. Uh, there's m multiple ways to hold this. Since this is a router, we primarily um, Since this is a router, we primarily, who cut this one? Oh. Since this is a router, we primarily screw stuff to the base. Um, we do have vacuum chucks. So we, what we do is we'll take a, um, a gasket, we'll set the gasket up, feed the gasket, and create an air manifold for it. and then just plumb uh, compressed air into it. And so once you get the gasket all weeded in there, you can actually just put the same piece down over and over and over again. So without having to screw it in, I could just rapidly change it out. So for production. But you notice something? I didn't have to do anything to the tool path. Once I have it made, I can make this part thousands of times over and over and over again. And all I have to do is keep resetting my tool height. All right, so jog it over to where the tool's over the top of the Part. Yep. yep, there you go. Yep. Okay, go Z minus a little bit. Minus? Z, or Z plus, excuse me. Z plus, okay, cool. So. Okay, uh, jog it, um, go X plus. Did you already, yeah. you already told to touch off yeah. tool length? Okay, that's cool. Yeah, always try to measure the center of the part when you're checking your tool height because that's gonna give you the most aggregate across the surface. But yep, yeah, it's ready to go. Start? Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna ask you to change the tool. I'm going to ask you to change the tool. Just resume. Now you hit pause on that. Just hit pause right there. Change that to 140%. Oh, not 160. <laughs> About 140. Yeah, that's good enough. Close enough right there. Hit resume. Yeah, the, it's clearing up the top of it because if you look in the geometry, it has a flat top. So what this is doing is making sure it has a flat top. Never ever assume that whatever stock you put in here is flat. It's a, it, we call that a skim cut. Skim cuts the top, make sure it's all flat, and then goes from there.
able to manually control it as well while it's on? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we'll come in and we'll we'll know like we'll need to clean up an edge. We'll actually jog it and clean it up and then you have your you know you have your readout that tells you exactly where it is. You can set your jog step and speed. So you can actually go in and come in and do a cleanup pass on something or make a sharp edge on something that maybe you forgot to program it and you'd have to go back and reprogram it. Another thing too is you can actually go in and, re and do another code, what's called a code snippet, a G-code snippet of another operation. Let's say I needed to come in with, and put some drill holes in those corners. I can actually go back to the cam software while this is cutting, program my drill holes and then just bring that little piece of G-code, and as long as I don't change zero position, I can recut, re-drill re those. And I can also go into the software, let's say I want to use an eighth inch instead of a quarter inch, I can just go in and in our toolbox that we pulled up, I can change it to an eighth of an inch, it'll recompute all of the, all of the, all of the G-code that uses that quarter inch tool number one for the new tool. Is it for what, what it says on there versus what it actually does in there? I've, we've cut parts on here where we'll hold a thousandth of an inch on, on tolerance, uh, but normally it's four thousandths. Four thousandths is a good. Because you're, you got to look at it. Does everybody know what stacking is? Okay. Does everybody know what a stacking error is? Okay. So if my platform is off by a thousandth of an inch, and my tool is worn down a thousandth of an inch, and my spindle run out is, runs out a thousandth of an inch. What is my starting error? Three thousandths. So you see how each one of your operations, each, each, each component of the system affects the overall accuracy of it. Temperature affects overall accuracy. What happens to my stock material when it's 90 degrees out? It's big. But what if I'm machining when it's 50 degrees? It's small. So what happens to what happens when that tool heats up in a cold environment? The tool expands. Okay, so you've got to look at all these different things that it can affect the accuracy of your part. Anybody here doing any micro or nano stuff? You guys have it the worst. Because you're you're dealing at such a small physics scale that even a gradient change of one degree in your scale is, is, is monumental to overcome. Um, so a lot of times in high precision machining, they'll actually machine in a liquid. They'll actually have a dielectric liquid or a lubricating liquid that's chilled to a certain temperature and they machine and the only thing that heats up is the contact point with the actual material. Okay, any, que any more questions on that? Okay, so to make the most accurate parts possible, you have to really dial your machine in. You have to know the mechanics of your machine. Cut some test pieces before you, if, if, especially if you have to do a lot of precision stuff. Cut some test pieces, know where your minimum and maximum tolerances are, and then work from there and work from your tolerance stack. And try to mitigate as much tolerance, because sometimes you might want to put an oversized cutter in, just because maybe it's cold out and you need to remove enough material. Or what if the part, what if the part that you're making is going to go in a cryo chamber? How do you machine a part to fit something if, it, if it's in liquid nitrogen? You have to figure out what your contraction rate of liquid nitrogen is and then you have to machine to that tolerance which means you're going to have to test, cut some test samples, put them in liquid nitrogen, measure them when they come out and see what that is and then compute for that in the CAD software. That's what makes it so easy, the CAD software portion of it because you can compensate for all that. But if your machine's not set up correctly and your tooling's old or it's not the right kind of tooling, you're just gonna be chasing your tail all day.
Okay, now you were asking me about manual control, so let me do something here and I'll show you how we can manually control it. Okay, that looks good. Let's move it back this way. So, I'm gonna go down Z. That looks good. So, what I'm gonna do is turn the spindle on. And I'm gonna come forward. That was a pretty deep cut. You see, I did it all in one plunge. Okay. So I can manually control it through here. So the good thing about this material is it, look, look how fast, uh, uh, what? I didn't do it. <coughs> okay. So notice that slot I manually cut in the side of that. See how clean that is? That's pretty deep cut, that's a quarter inch cut, 0.28. So that's why I like this material. I can cut fast. Okay. Could you make, make it execute manually a, say a line that, uh, in both X and Y axis? At the same time? Mm -hmm. uh, that'd be a diagonal line. Yeah. No, because okay. it's only meant to do X, X and Y movement on here. I can't really. Okay. So, so I would program that in. It'd just be easier that way. Any questions? Okay. All right, I think that's it.